you here. I want to thank the organizers of this meeting for the privilege of spending some time with you this afternoon. And, and welcome to the home base of your university, Montana State. You know, six years ago when I first came to Montana for the first time, I may add, I noticed immediately some very special characteristics in the people of this beautiful state. Actually, one day I'm riding in the car with the chair of the Board of Regents, Steve Barrett, if you know him well. He's a very seasoned attorney, kind of um, gruff sometimes he can be. And I'm just telling uh, Steve about my first impressions and I was saying like, Steve, people in this place are just so awesome, right? They, they love history, they have a passion for storytelling, they're authentic, they're friendly. And Steve kept driving and he looked at me and he said, we're lonely. <laughs> You know, I, I think that you will agree with me that in Montana there is this very special bond between history, poetry, and the landscape. In a way, today I'm reminded of this revered trilogy, and one of the best exponents of Montana's history, poetry, and landscape is, of course, Ivan Doig. And uh, less than a month ago when I joined 25 other citizens in writing a letter of support, to attract the Doig collection to our institution, I wrote the following, and I would like to read it because I think it fits with our topic today. I said, our land grant mission of teaching, research, and service make our university the natural partner for a man whose life and work is deeply tied to our state. Our historical commitment to educating the sons and daughters of the working families of America is clearly captured in Ivan's writings representing the lives and tribulations of ordinary people in rural Montana. This is a marriage made in big sky heaven. And I think you know that now the Doig Collection will be forever at Montana State University. <laughs> My dear friends, I, I believe that the power of the land grant university permeates everything we do and who we are. That is, as I said before, if you noticed before, that if when I welcome people, I always say, welcome to your university. Irrespective of where you graduated from, you are part of this incredible history <coughs> of the people's um, university. It is also a very personal influence in my life. I think that, uh, that you know the story. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Uh, if you detect an accent, <laughs> it's the mic. <laughs> and I was born and raised in the western city that it's the home, actually, to the only land-grant university in the Caribbean, and uh, the University of Puerto Rico at Mayagüez, which is also the only land-grant university in a Spanish-speaking country. Like many of you growing up, I had deep roots in the soil. My grandparents were farmers. My stepfather was a coffee merchant. And my mother was a homemaker, endowed with intelligence and drive. And perhaps like some of you, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. So what was it that made it possible for me to explore this academic life path? And the answer is very simple. I was given an opportunity to go to college. That's it. My, fa my father and my mother were very smart, but those doors were not open for them. Therefore, I'm determined to ensure that no young man or woman is ever deprived of the wonders of a college education because I know that education truly transforms lives. My education enabled me to start my career in Puerto Rico in the same institution where it all started for me. It made it possible to work at another fine land-grant university when I moved from Puerto Rico, the island of enchantment, to New Mexico, the land of enchantment. <laughs> I was convinced I was crossing the twilight zone. <laughs> and most recently, it, <clears throat> it has allowed me to live in the majestic state of Montana serving the first land-grant university in the state. Actually, upon learning about my appointment, a good friend who is a geologist texted me and said, 
Why is it that you only get to work in the most spectacular places on the face of the earth? <laughs> to give you a sense of perspective, my native Puerto Rico has a total area of 35 square miles. It could fit into the state of Montana about 42 times. <laughs> Keep in mind, however, that there are 3.5 million people living in Puerto Rico and one million in the fourth largest state of the Union. So, my friends, I have known the densely and the sparsely populated, the tropics and the desert, some climate extremes in different latitudes, and then uh, invigorating weather in Montana. <laughs> As the president of the largest university in the Big Sky State, I am frequently honored with opportunities to speak at events. A few years ago, I was invited to serve as the keynote speaker at an eighth grade graduation ceremony <coughs> in a rural community outside of Bozeman. The occasion required the combination of three rural schools to reach the celebratory quorum for the happy graduates all 11 of them. <laughs> At the end of the ceremony, while enjoying ice cream with members of the class and their families, a second grader approached me. There he was, with his wild blonde hair, wearing long pants that were already too short for him. When the time came for me to bid farewell, this farm boy, still enjoying his cup of ice cream, Look up with the brightest blue eyes you have ever seen and said to me, I hope you have a wonderful life. <laughs> you know, providing a good life for all Americans must have been on President Lincoln's mind when he signed the Morrill Act more than 150 years ago. So how did it all start? How was it that this nation, rich in natural resources and vast in land, came to design a system, a system that reached to each corner of its territory with access to education, research, and extension? We all know, I hope, the name of Justin Smith Morrill, who was born in Stratford, Connecticut, Vermont in 1810. With no formal education, after the age of 15, Morrill managed to amass a large enough fortune as a businessman that he retired at 38 and went into public life. Morrill always deplored not having a college degree. Actually, at age 80, he wrote, and this is a quote, to obtain the little education I have, has cut, cost me many evenings, Sundays after church, and scraps of time that could be devoted to it, involving far more labor than it would have necessitated if I could have been sent to proper institutions of learning. Morrill would go on to be one of the longest serving congressmen in the nation's history, almost 44 years, 12 in the House, and 31 in the Senate, up to the point of his death when he was 88. Actually, he was the chair of Senate Finance, just as Max Bacchus was. We know in mid-18th century, higher education in America had more in common with medieval Europe than with the rapidly industrializing bustle that was our country. The ivory tower welcomed primarily gentlemen of means, the clergy, and wealthy men of leisure. Much of higher education was expensive, private, and focused on the classics, law, medicine, and theology. At the same time, there was a crisis looming for the young na nation because of the lack of readily, readily available education for the people. In a way, my friends, the impetus for higher education, land-grant institutions, the reality is it came from famine. We were a hungry nation. We did not know how to cultivate the land. In 1858, Representative Morrill made his appeal to Congress, noting that 
Despite the nation's great wealth of land, it had imported $100 million of agricultural goods the previous year. That New England wheat and potato production had each dropped by 50% or more from 1840 to 1850. The cause, as I said, American farmers did not know how to farm. The land was being exhausted, soil was eroding, and crop yields were plummeting. To compound this situation even further, American companies and the government had to import engineers and technicians from Europe to build the bridges, the factories, the railroads, and all the number of complicated pop public works that we needed at the time. There was little to no place in America to train our own engineers or scientists. America needed education to help feed itself, build itself, and through it, empower the people. Years earlier, Thomas Jefferson had expressed his conviction in the need of a publicly funded education to protect the democratic future of America when he wrote in a letter, quote, let us in education dream of an aristocracy of achievement rising out of a democracy of opportunity. Preach, my dear sir, a crusade against ignorance. Establish and improve the law for educating the common people. Let our countrymen know that the people alone can protect us against these evils and that the tax which will be paid for this purpose is not more than the thousands of what will be paid if we leave people in ignorance. In fact, when Morrill made his first proposal to Congress to establish this new brand of colleges and universities, he placed such a high value on an educated citizenry that tuition was to be free. Morrill's proposal, on the other hand, as you can imagine, place yourself in that context. It was a controversial proposal. Providing higher education for the working classes? That was not universally accepted. As Peter McGraw has asserted, quote, we should make no mistake. This was a radical populist concept. Five years would go by before the bill was signed into law and its chronology reads like a serial novel, my friends. The first time in 1857, the House did not allow the legislation to see the light of day. The year after, the bill passed the House by five votes, only to be defeated by the Senate. Another session brought with it renewed animosity and members of the Senate viciously attacked the moral bill along the way. It was called, here are three quotes, num number one, quote, one of the most monstrous, iniquitous, and dangerous measures which have ever been submitted to Congress. Another one called it the most extraordinary engine of mischief. And a third one asserted that it was an unconstitutional robbing of the treasury for the purpose of bribing the states. By 1859, the Morrill Bill passed the Senate with the vote of 103 by 100. And about a week later, President James Buchanan vetoed it arguing it was unconstitutional. Morrill used this crisis to his advantage, pushing forward his bill. He made it more appealing by including military instruction as part of the land-grant mission. The Union needed officers, he argued, and thanks to the secession of the southern states from the Union, the congressmen who had formed the backbone of the resistance to this bill were no longer there to oppose it. That's why we have ROTC in our land-grant universities, right? The concept of a system of colleges and universities built in the people's interest was actually a project that was initiated by Jonathan Baldwin Turner, 
an educator based in Illinois. Originally from New Haven, Connecticut, Turner abandoned his studies at Yale College to teach in Illinois. He would devote his entire life to advocate for a reality very different from the one he witnessed, in which only 2%, 2% of the American population had access to uh, higher education. He stated, quote, we need a system of education adapted to the needs of the common man, which would elevate him to his right place in society. Education should be practical as well as academic, and it should not be the monopoly of the privileged few, but rather the right of everyone who has the desire and the ability to learn. Let me repeat that last part. The right of everyone who has the desire and the ability to learn. It was Turner who came up with the three basic concepts of the Land Grant Act. Number one, universal access to higher education. Number two, a curriculum based on practical instruction without exclusion of the classical education. Actually, the main objective of these colleges, says the Morrill Act, is the study of agriculture and the mechanical arts without excluding the classical component, right? And third, the third component was the funding mechanism of an endowment generated by the sale of federal land. At the time, Congress was actually exploring the idea of establishing a National College of Agriculture following the model of the naval and military ones built in Annapolis and West Point. That's what we would have ended. But how fortunate for us in Montana that Turner advocated for the establishment of not one national college, but rather of a system of colleges that would encompass the nation, not only in the states that were more populated, but in every state and territory <coughs> of the Union. It was Turner who, on the advice of his elected officials, sent his concept papers and documents to Congressman Morrill. Why? Seeking his support as a representative of one of the oldest states of the Union. They were the ones that had the influence. And fascinatingly, it was Turner who approached his friend in Illinois. His name's friend was Abraham Lincoln. With this idea, and it was the stroke of then President Lincoln spent on July the 2nd, 1862, that brought us here. In the midst of a civil war. You know, at that time, the people's representatives were hard at work. In fact, in the year of 1862, the US Congress produced several pieces of legislation that would have had an enormous impact on the country and particularly for us in the American West. The Federal Department of Agriculture was established in the month of May of that year, in the same month that saw the passage of the Homestead Act. Congress approved the Pacific Railroad Act on July the 1st, 1862, just one day before lawmakers approved the Morrill Act. The way I like to think about this is that the Homestead Act and the Railroad Act would provide us with geographical and horizontal mobility, while the Land Grant Act gave us the vertical and social mobility that has strengthened American democracy. What a powerful lesson for all of us here, that rather than being constrained by the difficult circumstances of the time, those elected officials envisioned a better and brighter future by establishing one public university in each state and territory of the Union for the sons and daughters of the working families of America. The passage of the Morrill Act in 1862 did not end Justin Morrill's work. When he saw the initial funding was not enough to ensure the survival of land grants, he presented seven more bills to help aid colleges and universities. His bills were killed 12 times until 1890 
when the second Morrill Act was passed, which gave a boost of funding to states and gave unprecedented access to higher education to African American students. The Morrill Act even received new life over a hundred years later with the passage of the third Land Grant Act of 1994 which gave inclusion to a group of Native American tribal colleges in over 12 states. In fact, it was Montana State University President Michael Malone who chaired the commission, which was formed by the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, which ultimately made the third land grant bill a reality. With this passage, Tribal colleges across the nation were designated as land-grant colleges. Montana added seven for a grand total of eight land-grant colleges and universities, the largest number of any state. Montana State had also played a prominent role in the early 1960s when it joined a group of 19 universities to purchase the Justin Morrill Homestead in Stratford, uh, Vermont. Today, if you go there, and, and I've been there, in the entry hallway of the house, there is a plaque that commemorates 1969 as the year in which those institutions donated the property for the enjoyment of all citizens of the world. Some of those institutions included, I'm not going to read the 19, but so that you know that we were in good company, Cornell University, Kansas State University, Louisiana State University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the other MSU, Michigan State University, <laughs> North Dakota State University, Purdue University, Rutgers University, and Montana State College. By the way, in regards to our name this year, marks the 50th anniversary of our change from Montana State College to Montana State University. You know, the transformational power of the Morrill Act was also enhanced by the addition of research to these universities with the approval of the Hatch Act in 1897. Very, e very easy. What happened was we established these colleges and universities to study agriculture and we didn't have much to teach. So first we needed to start researching, right? And our tripartite mission was completed with the addition of extension with the Smith-Lever Act of 1914 to give access to the non-residents of the universities, as they were called. Every day, in everything we do, land-grant universities challenge the odds and confirm that access and excellence <coughs> are not two mutually exclusive terms. You know, when people recommend that we should raise admission standards in order to improve graduation rates, I always say, that's way too easy. That's not our history, right? We didn't have land-grant universities only in the most mature or better populated states. And by the way, I have a, fr a good question for you. How many homesteaders do you think were college ready? <laughs> right? And yet, we remain undaunted in our commitment to educate the sons and daughters of the working families of America. There is a place, there has to be a place for the future generations exemplified by that second grader from rural Montana at Montana State University. In the words of Robert Sternberg, our mission is to provide access not to restrict entry. Land-grant institutions are particularly focused on value added, producing the future leaders who make the world a better place. Since we're celebrating homecoming, let me close by telling you about a remarkable man, a leader and an MSU alum. Maurice Rolf Hilleman was born in 1919 on a farm near the town of Mile City, Montana. His parents were Anna and Gustav Hilleman, and he was their eighth child. His twin sister died when he was born, and his mother died two days later. Little Maurice was raised in the nearby household of his uncle and worked in his youth on the family farm. Later in life, he credited much of his success with vaccines to his work with chickens as a boy. 
Due to lack of money, Maurice almost failed to attend college. His eldest brother interceded, and Hilleman graduated in 1941 as first in his class from Montana State College on a scholarship. He won a fellowship to the University of Chicago and received his doctoral degree in microbiology. Hilleman specialized in vaccinology and developed over three dozen vaccines. Of the 14 vaccines routinely recommended, Hilleman developed eight, including those for measles, mumps, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, chickenpox, meningitis, and pneumonia. Hilleman is credited with saving more lives than any other scientist of the 20th century. During his life, this Montana country boy was elected as a member of the U.S. National Academy of Science, the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. In 1988, President Ronald Reagan presented him with the National Medal of Science, the nation's highest honor for scientific enterprise. Hilleman received the Prince Mahidol Award from the King of Thailand for the advancement of public health, as well as a Special Lifetime Achievement Award from the World Health Organization, the Mary Woodard Lasker Award for Public Service, and the Sabin Gold Medal and Lifetime Achievement Awards. He died in 2005. Robert Gallo, co-discoverer of the AIDS virus, has said, quote, if I had to name a person who has done more for the benefit of human health with less recognition than anyone else, it would be Maurice Hilleman. Maurice, he said, should be recognized as the most successful vaccinologist in history. And he was the product of your land-grant university, Montana State. So today, my dear friends, let's start firm in our commitment to celebrating the legacy that we have inherited, the moral act and the visionary land-grant system it established. As we go back to our respective engines of mischief, <laughs> let's assert our unequivocal and renewed efforts to the preservation and expansion of this extraordinary feat in American history. I wish you success as you continue to advance history and poetry and beauty in Montana. Actually, I guess what I'm saying is, I hope you have a wonderful life. Thank you.